Hello everybody, welcome back to the ASUS ROG YouTube channel. This is JJ once again, and I brought somebody along with me. I've got Eric, she's one of my colleagues here from uh, the ASUS family here at uh, headquarters. And uh, we're gonna be doing something a little bit different than our normal overview and unboxings. We're actually gonna be doing actually a build overview. We last did one of these actually for Z68. Uh, so we're gonna be doing one for X79 and Sandy Bridge E, and kind of uh, how to go and taking consideration all the different parts that come together when you're actually gonna be doing a build of your own. Uh, so thank you for uh, coming along, Eric. Thanks for having me. Awesome, so uh, I know that uh, you're just like myself, a little bit of a do-it-yourself aficionado, and you like actually putting together builds, and um, I know that uh, recently we actually did one, uh, not so recently anymore, I guess yeah, now, yeah. Um, last, uh, I think, on your design system, right? Yep, yep. Um, so what was it that we put in the design system? Uh, we got the X58 uh, Sabertooth motherboard, and and then uh, it was Golf Town, right? 12 yeah, core, right? Town. Okay, so we set up pretty much the whole setup there. We had like a GTX 570, we had a 980X, we had 12 right. gigabytes of RAM, we put an SSD in there, so it was a pretty checked out system. Yeah, exactly. I know um, definitely a big upgrade from the previous Core 2 Duo yeah. uh, system that you guys were using, so it was a huge increase in productivity on your guys' end. Right. And uh, I think that's how kind of we were approaching this build in terms of the consideration is that, you know, Sandy Bridge really kind of showcases its legs in both, you know, the content, creation, productivity, so stuff like Premiere and Photoshop, which you use day in and day out, exactly. uh, but at the same time for somebody like myself, which is just looking for an awesome desktop experience, whether it's general web browsing, audio and video encoding, you know, putting that to mobile devices, or looking to have a really awesome, you know, uh, PC for for, uh, for high-end gaming, that's going to be able to get the job done too, right? Right. Um, so I think that's our perspective in terms of what we're looking to do. So um, let's go ahead and jump into actually some of the components here that we're going to be jumping on board with in terms of putting this together. Cool. So uh, let's go ahead and move this guy here out of this way, and we're going to take a look and see actually what we're running here. So this is it right here. Uh, this is gonna be pretty much the system that we're gonna be going over and using as kind of a reference as we go ahead and go over all the key components that we're gonna be introducing uh, for this X79 build. So it's pretty much all completed here and we're gonna tell you guys you know, a little bit about why we've decided to go with some of the components that we have here, uh, how they make sense and how kind of they complement each other in terms of coming all together. So uh, where do you think we should start off here? Start with the case, what do we got going on in the case? Okay, so this is actually a really awesome case. This is Corsair uh, and their Carbide 400 series case. So we've gone ahead and picked this for a couple of key reasons. One is that with X79, um, heat is definitely an, uh, an issue to be aware of. Um, you know, as you really start to overclock the platform and you have a lot of the higher end components that we're talking about here, you know, whether it's one big GPU, two GPUs, you know, a lot of different drives, things like that, you want a lot of flexibility when it comes to cooling, right? right. So uh, when we take a look at this, we've got, you know, 120 millimeter, 140 millimeter uh, fan support here at the top for two fans. We've got another 120 millimeter support here on the back. You've even got open cut uh, inlet and outlet for water cooling if you are a water cooling user. Uh, you've also got two 120 millimeter front intake fans. So this, this chassis really takes care of you in terms of that. And um, as you guys might have seen in our overclocking overview video, right, we discussed the importance of being able to have flexibility of positioning these fans, right? So um, if you want to pass me over actually that fan, you know, this kind of segues into one of the components that we picked here. So we picked actually a Cooler Masters Excalibur a four pin series of actually fans. This is 120 millimeter specifically because it gave us actually a, a lot of flexibility at having a high performance fan but that could be controlled uh, with a lot of flexibility. And we'll talk about that, I guess, when we get to the motherboard. Uh, but we actually have two of them positioned to downward fire. So they bring a lot of airflow down on the actual memory modules themselves, uh, the VRM heat sink, and also on the back plane of the motherboard, which isn't something you normally think about, but it's there. Yeah. And if we can cool it, it'll help to give us better overclocking results and maintain long-term stability. Plus you've got some nice, you know, just cool stuff. Like you've got front USB three ports, you know, you've got uh, toolless uh, hard drive support. So a lot of nice big pluses on the chassis, you know, removable dust filter, a lot of great stuff like that. So that's definitely the bedrock of our system right there. Cool. So uh, moving on over, I guess uh, we'll talk about my favorite thing, motherboard, right? Yeah. So uh, we've uh, gone ahead and tapped our, our P9 X79 Pro Series board. So this is pretty much our mid-range series board. Uh, gives us about everything we could want and it's just cutting a couple of little items uh, that we might not necessarily need depending on our day in and day out usage. So here, you know, we've got SATA 6G, SSD caching support, we've got Bluetooth, USB 3, we have two-way, even three-way SLI support. You've got our Digi Plus power control, our UV5 BIOS, you know, all the real cool stuff that makes an ASUS board special. And definitely for anybody that wants to know more information, they can definitely take a look at the overview and unboxing video. We give all the good tidbits there. So we've got this I board. wanted to go with like the deluxe board, you know, 
what would I be gaining by going deluxe rather than the pro? You know, that's a great question. Um, you know, if you were looking to have, a, I think, a, a little bit more of a multimedia connected system, yeah. um, then the deluxe is going to be a perfect fit. And then one, it bumps you over to BT 3.0. So with BT 3.0, if like maybe you got like a Zenbook, latest generation smartphone, you got BT 3 support on that, you're going to get higher uh, speed transfers. And you also have 82.11 Wi-Fi support built onto that board as well. There's a couple of other little things as well, but that's kind of like the, the two real key uh, component differences in terms of the kind of day in and day out experience that you're going to get between the pro and the deluxe model okay so uh that lets us cover the board and you know one item that uh we actually forgot to note on there was uh, the fan control support all right you know so that's a key item especially as when we talk about the in total right we're gonna have one two three four five fans here in the system is that we do want to make sure to have the system be quiet in terms of ramping when it needs to to ensure you know optimal cooling experience but at the same time when we're just doing normal things uh, you know like web browsing we want these to kind of be running accordingly uh, so when you take into consideration we've got some really awesome fan controls here whether you define them in the UEFI define them in Windows you're gonna be good to go in terms that you can set these up to your liking in terms of you know lower ramping or higher ramping so you're set so I can actually go into Windows and control the fans from there rather than do in the that's that's hundred percent right. You wouldn't even have to enter the UEFI at all, and you would actually have per chassis control, uh, whether it's on the back chassis, uh, the top of the chassis, or the front intake of the chassis. So, if you want to have these ramp a little bit more, because of course these are going to be uh, giving more airflow as you're maybe uh, you know overclocking or heavily doing something like a render in Premiere, right. then you can have these guys. Um, and same thing if you want to have a little bit more cooling performance for your CPU because this is where our H60 is going into that we could define that and if you want to keep these at a much lower profile we could define that as well. Alright. That's so very cool. cool. So uh, I guess next we got yeah. got the uh, power supply. So we've gone ahead and tapped Corsair's AX uh, 750. The AX represents actually their gold series. Uh, so this is 90% power efficiency. So we picked this for a couple of key reasons. One is that we wanted a modular power supply. So we can see here, we tried to keep things actually pretty tidy, pretty, pretty neat. Uh, so of course it being modular gives us a lot of flexibility, but generally when you go with a modular power supply, you undercut the efficiency. So we still maintain that high rating of efficiency and that also gives us another plus one, which is actually that in most situations, I'd probably say, uh, you know, 90% of the time, oddly enough, probably this PSU is going to not be rotating its fan at all. So it's going to be pretty much like in a passive state of cooling. Mm -hmm. So the great thing about that is that we get high performance power delivery, but also maintaining that whole theme of being quiet when we're using our system, whether we're talking about it idle usage or even as we're actually gaming or maybe, you know, fully rendering something. So uh, that's one of the main reasons why we went ahead with this power supply. It's quiet. Uh, under load, but then we get the nice pluses in terms of you know 90% power efficiency. So that also gives us the ability to upgrade support. Maybe you want to go to two-way or three-way SLI, something down the, down the road. We're going to be good to go. So even though this is 750, it's going to handle SLI no problem. 100%. Yeah, I mean sometimes there's a tendency where people uh, want to kind of overshoot. They go to like an 850 thousand watt power supply as soon as they think of two cards, yeah. and that that's really overkill. It's really about the quality of the power supply that you're utilizing. So since we're going with actually such a high efficiency power supply, we're giving ourselves more than enough uh, envelope room in terms of being able to add another GPU down the road and not have it be an issue. Of course, if you really did want to kind of have even that kind of additional level of flexibility in terms of having that much more wadding on the system, yep. of course you could jump up to an 850, uh, you know, or, or even higher. All right. Okay. So, uh, cooler? Yeah. Cooler. So uh, we've gone ahead and tapped uh, Corsair's H60 closed water loop system. You know, I know in uh, actually your system when we set it up, we used Cooler Master's uh, Hyper 212 Plus, which is a great solution. Right. As you saw, you know, it gives you really cool uh, results. You actually, we have your system overclocked to four gigahertz. You use it right. day in and day out, but it's very quiet. Yep. You know, so it was a great solution. Uh, with Sandy Bridge e, though, you're pushing a lot more heat than you were pushing on Gulf Town in the nine. Uh, the 980X, so we need something that's going to give us a little bit better temperature performance. We wanted still something that was going to be quiet as well though, so uh, we were shooting for kind of an overall average about maybe 4.5 to 4.6 in terms of silver clock, so that fits really well with this CPU cooler. And this one actually also comes included with a four pin fan, so uh, while we opted to go ahead and get a couple of these Excalibur fans, we didn't actually need to get a four pin fan that was controllable for our, our H60 because that already came included with the unit, so we're good to go there. Now, uh, one thing to keep in mind though is, is that um, for this type of build, the cooling performance that the H60 is gonna give you is gonna really be solid at kind of normal everyday usage. So we're talking like web browsing, Blu-ray playback, um, you know, online video, 
gaming, but when you talk about maybe content creation, right. if you're gonna be doing like a lot of rendering, a lot yeah. of filters, that can use a lot of processing power, actually quite a bit more than even the latest generation of game engines. Yeah. And when you're pushing that, you could start to be pushing maybe some of the thermal limits of what this cooler can do uh, if you have a lot of voltage and you have a lot of, of frequency that you're trying to take care of on the 860 side. So you might need to consider maybe jumping over that point to an H80 or an H100. Just kind of depends a little bit on the usage model. If you mirror more kind of maybe my usage, yeah. I don't ever use Photoshop. Um, you know, the most I ever use is maybe like Photoshop online, maybe do a little some quick edits or something like that, yeah. then I'm going to be fine. So it just kind of depends a little bit on your segment. So somebody like me who's using Photoshop and using Premiere and you know all that, the Adobe Creative Suite out there, you know, I'm gonna. I should probably go up to the H80. Yeah, I would definitely say consider the H80, if not even the H100, because same thing. If you want to be able to mirror a lot of cooling performance, but you still want to keep the system very quiet under that higher frequency, right. I think that's going to be a much better fit. But then you could still also, of course, get that great cooling performance even when you switch over and you know okay. your inner games. Yep. So if we can take care of your workload, it's going to be overkill actually for the workload that's going to be put under it when you're actually gaming. All right, that's cool. Yeah. So uh, moving on over, GPU. GPU. GPU, so we've gone ahead and actually tapped ROG. Uh, so this is not an actual ROG build here, but uh, we went ahead and went with our Republic of Gamers GTX 580 Matrix. So we pretty much went with the fastest single graphics card that you can get on the market uh, that's not G dual GPU like the 590 or like the Mars, yeah. uh, for instance. Main reason why we want to do that is because we wanted to give a high level of gaming performance for 1080p gaming or even 2560 gaming. So for those people that are out there jumping onto like 30 inch panels. So we got a lot of flexibility in terms of being able to play pretty much any game on the market with this kind of graphics card. Plus we tap the matrix because this is gonna be a high performance system. We do wanna overclock it a bit. Right. Um, you know, and definitely our normal GTX 580 directs U2 can overclock with the best of them. But you know, we like the fit of this card a little bit more in terms of black. It's got the LED load indicator. Right. Allows us to hardware lock in the profile support in terms of once we overclock it, we can put it in there. And even if we didn't run our software anymore, we'd still hardware keep it. Just like kind of overclocking from the BIOS in the same way. So we got a lot of flexibility with this card, but you could definitely go with a GTX 570. You could even go with a GTX 560 Ti and still get really strong gaming performance. Okay. So a lot of flexibility with this card in here. But uh, the other cool part too is it'll kind of segue into some of our multimedia choices that you get support for 3D vision as well as going with an NVIDIA card, so that's pretty cool too. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So what do we got next here? I think we should go with memory. Memory, of course. So memory is really cool because, of course, with X79, Sandy Bridge G, we have the introduction of the quad-channel memory controller. Right. I know when we set up your system, you were actually running 4 gigabytes, and we upgraded you to 12 gigabytes because yeah. you were like, oh, man, we've got to take advantage of the triple channel. Yep. And so here we just went into obscene kind of overload, right, because right. uh, we went ahead and we've tapped uh, Corsair's Vengeance kit. So we got DDR3 1600. Uh, this is a 16 gigabyte kit, and we're actually utilizing two of them. So in total, we actually have 32 gigabytes here on the system. What are you going to do with all that memory? Uh, you know, that's a great question. We've actually got um, a really cool uh, feature and overview video that discusses how to set up a RAM cache and a RAM disk on your system. Yeah. But that's pretty much our focus is that we want to use about eight gigabytes for our primary OS. Okay. So that would be, you know, for normal productivity, for web browsing, things along those lines. And then we have another eight gigabyte set up as what's called a RAM cache. So that would actually be a low level system cache that all our applications and everything would uh, pump through that. And that gives us really high level performance, even faster than SSD performance. Wow. And then our remaining memory, we can actually have set up as a RAM disk. So if you wanted to run like your web browser, Photoshop, you even wanted to maybe uh, run like a large game from there, like Battlefield 3, you could run it all directly from a RAM disk. So not only having the flexibility of what X79 gives us with quad channel and eight DIMMs, yeah. uh, but also you know the cost and performance of what we get when we go with something like this. This Corsair kit of memory gives us a lot of cool flexibility of really turning this in kind of a whole nother level of performance. Sure. So it's pretty sweet. Yeah, that is awesome. So uh, jumping on over, I guess we got storage, right? Yep. So with storage, you know, there's always a lot of considerations to take into play. You know, things have only gotten faster and faster and faster. But you know, us kind of want to keep with the theme of going with a system that makes sense. Uh, we've gone ahead and we've tapped Western Digital's two terabyte black series hard drive. So that's kind of like the foundation of our whole system where you would pretty much have your OS and all your games and everything installed on. Now this board does support ASUS SSD caching support. So uh, we've gone ahead and then tapped something like either a 60 gig 
or uh, as we saw right here, we have a, a Corsair Force 120 gigabyte, and that would be our SSD caching configuration. Okay. So that would give us the improvement that we're looking for in terms of having faster boot performance, faster read performance. Write performance would more or less be about the same, but we get a little bit more consistent write performance, not necessarily an increase. Okay. Uh, for the guys that really kind of want to push the limit, uh, especially in your situation too, where you can take advantage more of actually writing to the disk, right. when you're starting to write really large files from like a, a productivity standpoint, yeah. you know, you might maybe actually want to have something like a Corsair Force GT, which gives you the fastest performance, set that up as your primary OS drive, maybe even a RAID configuration, but then still have your SSD caching set up as like your storage volume where you keep all your files uh, that you're kind of done with but you still want to be able to access over a period of time or that you just want snappier performance too from even like library support like if you had a whole bunch of photographs or music on there you don't need super high performance but the fact that it's under an SSD cache makes it a lot more snappy and when we talk about even as a backdrop we still even got the RAM cache running in the back all that too okay. really cool tricked out system what's the force GT gonna give me over the force just um, you know, speed? yeah, they've got actually a little bit uh, tweaked firmware and they're actually using a higher class of actually onboard memory to the component. Okay. So it's pretty much just taking it to that next level in terms of performance. Uh, the, this standard drive is generally going to be closer to about uh, peaking about 500 megabytes on both a read and write performance, while this one's going to be consistently going to be over about the 515 to as much as 555 megabytes. So it's kind of really just pushing that SATA bus to its limit in terms of performance. So pretty sweet. Cool. Um, so Let's go audio. Yeah, audio. I, that, that's a big one for me. You know, we've got actually a brand new uh, Realtek uh, codec that we incorporate on X79, and we have some new sound support in terms of DTS Connect and some cool options. But I really like to have kind of a much higher class of audio. Um, you know, I'm a big audio guy, not only in the movies that I watch and in music playback, but just kind of the general experience. So we tap Zonar a DX sound card. So this is PCI Express. Uh, we tapped this one because for one, with our boards, we went to a newer generational layout where our big focus was about PCI Express, not the previous generation PCI, e, right. excuse me, uh, PCI. So that's one benefit, but we were get a really high level of performance and it kind of matches a lot of the multimedia aspects. So one, we get a card that's great for gaming, we get a card that's great for music playback, and we just get a great card in terms of audio reproduction. So that matches really well in terms of not only the high performance uh, graphics card that we have that gives us that immersive experience, but then moving even over to our Okay, so we've got ODD. Now this is a great one. It's a lot of times overlooked actually by a lot of people because it's just kind of like your optical disk drive. Right. But um, you know, just like everything here, we think that it makes sense to go with actually a Blu-ray writer. One from a productivity standpoint, a content creation, and even backup, which is something a lot of people forget about in terms of backing up their system. It's nice to have a Blu-ray uh, writer because at this point now we can do 50 gigabytes in terms of a single disk. So for you, you know, every three months, every five months, if you're thinking about, you know, that you want to take those hard copies that normally you could be, of course, put into a hard drive, but hard drive can fail. Right. You know, you could have that secondary long-term backup where you can have your files, you can have your whole operating system image. You can create your own recovery disk. You can do a lot of really cool stuff with having that much capacity available to you as a backup medium. But on the flip side, as a read medium, of course, gives us flexibility for standard CD, DVD, and BD, BD playback. Plus, we also come including uh, this drive with uh, 3D playback software, so you get 3D vision support. So if you want to go ahead and kick this out to like our 27-inch 3D panel, then you've got either 3D movie playback experience or you can do, you know, uh, 3D vision and gameplay. And if you want to run like an HDMI cord out to like your big old 60-inch, you know, TV, if you have a 60-inch, I've yeah. only got a, oh, a 47. Um, but you could go ahead and have a pretty amazing experience in your home entertainment center as well. So you've got a lot of flexibility actually with something as simple as an optical drive. Awesome. So uh, that overall, I think, actually gives us a little bit of an overview regarding kind of all the key components that outline our X79 system. So as you can see, I think there was a little bit of a kind of rhyme and reason to every single thing that we kind of introduced here. I know that for us, uh, the next part of this video is actually going to be probably something a lot of you guys are going to be interested in too. There's a lot of different aspects regarding how to work with an X79 system, like changes in the CPU socket, how to correctly mount uh, the CPU, how to install that, um, you know, how to take into consideration, you know, uh, the memory and how do you install that? Is there any differences with eight DIMM configurations? Yeah. And just overall, some of the other considerations that you have when you're putting together a brand new system, right? Uh, that we're gonna go ahead and hopefully make it a little bit clearer to you guys. So overall, as always, if you guys have any questions, uh, comments, feedback, make sure to drop them there on the YouTube page. Hit us up on Facebook or Twitter, or as always, head over to the ASUS ROG forums. And uh, please subscribe if you enjoyed the video. As always, thank you. Thanks.